writing it up from the beginning. Um, so one of the things is you'll hear people call it a JV partner or whatever. Um, it's not a partnership. So in any of your legal terms and any of your documentation, go talk to your lawyer. They're going to tell you really clearly. Do not put the word partner anywhere because mm -hmm. partnership is actually a different business structure and maybe you do need a partnership but just make sure that you're writing this up with a lawyer don't download your JV agreement off of Google from the states or whatever um, because you could accident accidentally be writing up an agreement for something completely different than what you actually intended to do and then CRA when you do taxes is going to look at that slaughter <laughs>
their half um, biannual reports, things like that. But to be honest, they only have the keys to the property and they don't know who the tenants are and they don't care because the <laughs> property is just performing. They know where they are, they can drive by it. Um, but for us, that's what our working thing is. But it's totally whatever you make it. So we know some people who they split the responsibility. Somebody's really great at bookkeeping or they're, they're like Lindsay and they've got the design skills. Um, and so they may be like, I don't want to deal with the tenants, yeah. but when you're renovating, I want to be in there, right? So you can totally vary it. And it's a pretty widespread topic. Like one reason we wanted to cover this one at this meetup is because of the frothy market, you know, people jump into it and they say, I'm going to be the working partner. I'm going to be the JV and I meet them. And I start asking them kind of leading questions to qualify them before I, I really dig in. And a lot of times they don't have an understanding of what their role is going to be or what their value proposition is, right? Like I had one person at an event once ask me that, you know, like, how do I become a working partner? I'm like, well, what do you, what do you do right now? And then, oh, you know, I have a lot of time. I'm like, well, go educate yourself. Right, I said educate yourself more than anybody else in the entire market in terms of what the market's doing, where there's opportunities, like the working partner aspects. I'm like, go did Google property management and figure out how to do every one of those things better than a property manager. Because essentially a working partner becomes a property manager that like lives with you, but is also sharing in the benefit of the equity gain and obviously financial benefit in the property, you know, and that's where it's an interesting relationship where you have a very vested interest in the success of the property because you have a financial interest in it, right? We don't get any returns if the property's not performing well. Yeah, that's, so, that's how we structure it. So um, the working partner, they, they have to work. And if they don't work, then they don't get paid. Yeah. Yeah. Potentially, property managers can be getting a return regardless of what they're doing. Like, the, it's not necessarily that's an interest. There are some amazing property managers, yeah. but there's also some that aren't. And they're getting paid no matter what they do or don't do. We get our returns only when the property and I've seen cycles like that, just candidly. We work with some great property managers as well, but I've seen cycles in the past where property managers will get too busy for their own good, and then all of a sudden, little things start getting left, and then a year goes by on a property, you go to sell it, and you're talking like a $75,000 difference on a property, where you know sometimes if you work with the right working partners, they're keeping tabs on it because they own it as well. So it's an interesting dynamic, but it's, it's not all roses. Um, there's a lot of JVs that people get into where they don't take care of the legwork ahead of time. So what are some of the things that you would maybe forewarn a money partner in working with a JV that they need to know going into a partnership with somebody? You want to, you want to touch on that first? And He's going to let me I'll, talk. I'll, I'll <laughs> uh, uh, so um, one thing we always say, and this is kind of crazy, but we always say make sure you're a good fit. We've actually turned working or financial JVs away. Um, they weren't a good fit for us personality-wise. If your goals, if your core values don't align or your strategy doesn't align, then they could give you all the money in the world, but it's going to be a really hard road to yeah. partner with them. Maybe they're a better private lender for you, or maybe you should steer them to a different JD. And we've actually taken financial investors before and said, we're not for you. Either the property type that they were looking for or um, whatever that was, we weren't a good match. How they wanted to run their business and how we wanted to run ours is just not how it is. So we were able to either direct them to somebody who was a better fit or, you know, kind of say to them, you know, we don't have it. And it's crazy. You're like, people are going to give you money. Why wouldn't you take that? Um, but it's going to be, we're doing buy, hold, buy and hold investments traditionally. So this is like a long-term play. This is three, five, ten years. Um, if we can't get along for coffee, or if we're kind of feeling like that, that bumping heads from the get-go, that if you can't meet in the middle somehow, then, so that's one of the biggest things is, you know, make sure you're good fit before you even get in. Don't just take it because somebody gave it to you. Like, you know, don't get greedy. Think about it as a quality relationship and a long-term um, development. Uh, you know, if it was a private lender who's just gonna sign a piece of paper and hand you money. 9% on the yeah. return, then that's a separate conversation. Then that's a separate conversation, but you're actually gonna be you know, co-owners of this property in a way, right? So. From a from a number standpoint, I mean, this is this is a business. I mean, it's a relationship, but it's a business too. Um, run your numbers conservatively, and when you when you present a property, um, have them shown different ways. So you have an everyday. Hopefully, this is how it's going to ideally work on an everyday basis. This is a worst case scenario. Are you okay with that? If that happens, are you scared you're going to cry? If you're not going to cry, know that this is where it's going to be most of the time. And maybe there's a third strategy that we can implement that we can even get more. I never promise that, just say that's possible down the road. And if we're good with this, then that's something to ask is, how do you run your numbers? Where did you get that information from? What is it based on? Do you use professionals um, on your team, or did you just randomly think this up? 
So ask those questions because at the end of the day, um, it is your investment, um, everyone's investment. We want everyone to do well, um, but be conservative and then under promise over deliver. That's, that's our All day, every day. Question. Have you ever had a property that didn't perform in a, prop, like a positive profit margin? And if so, how did you get through that storm? Because you guys set it up as you take zero if, if it's not performing the way you like, pitched it to a client. Um, touch wood, we, we've never had a property that um, on, on a yearly basis be in, in a negative number. We, we went into properties, we we're probably going to touch on one today, that it didn't look good from the get-go. It was like, how do I turn this around? Yeah. Yeah. You but knew I was going to bring that yeah, up. Yeah. A, it was, okay, well, our big deal is property generally needs to cash flow from day one. Yeah. It might not be very much, but it has to have a goal of where it's going to be. That's one of our founding philosophies. If it does not cash flow day one, unless there's a really good strategy in place to get that cash flowing as quickly as possible, we're not in. So if you're, the asking price is up here, but it cash flows down here, unless we get it down here, we don't go into the property. Um, because there's, there's those signs where you can say, well, there's so much potential. Well, how long does it take to, to see that potential? Is it a year? Is it two years? And can everyone in the group sit on that? Group? We're not one of those types of people. Um, so have the strategy in place. Yeah. Generally, our if a property is not cash flowing in our instance in our portfolio with what we're doing, it's because we purposely are making it not cash flow, which sounds crazy, but it's because there's a major renovation on, or we're purposely holding the property a unit vacant because we didn't find a good fit tenant. Yeah. But then we're talking with our investor that we're working with and saying this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're gonna hold it a month extra vacant because all the applicants we had weren't a good fit for the building or we're gonna do some renovations and we're it's a planned yeah. it's a planned yeah. time where we're doing that. We run all of our properties with reserve accounts too. So we've never done a cash call, call on the property because we always have reserves um, on all of our properties in the bank account and it's always a planned one. So knock on wood, you know, barring any large uh, unforeseen things, um, you know, we've always got that buffer built in and we're having that conversation to say this is a planned negative cash flow period for a specific goal. Your reserves, are you running 5% just putting that into an account or how do you guys build the reserves? I generally don't look at those percentage. I generally take the what the property is on a monthly expense and say we need at least one month expenses. I'm assuming nobody pays rent, yeah. the mortgage, insurance, taxes, all that type of stuff, put that in from the get-go. Mm -hmm. um, and then for barring everything is goes to hell in the hand basket, we're, we're good for a month, we have time to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be five, it might be six, sure. it might be three. So each property is separate, you strap, you strap on, they do it separately so it's not one pool. Yeah. Each, each uh, property, uh, we run each property with a separate bank account. Um, our, our accountants like that a lot better too. For it's clarity. For, actually, for, for it's bookkeeping it's a lot easier. Um, even if we have multiple properties with the same JV investor, each property has its own account and each is having a reserve. Okay. Yeah. So. You're just building that up, running like a business, right? Like you're taking out a percentage, putting it back into your marketing fees and your maintenance and everything else. It's all part and, of it. And when you do your distributions, yeah. you only do like your cash flow distributions back to the reserve. So that reserve is always there. You're never drawing the account. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah, I think that it tests to running it like an actual <laughs> business, not just a handshake agreement with somebody saying, yeah, this is what we're doing. This is the partnership. You're good with that. Great. Not having proper legal paperwork in place. We could talk, touch on that in a second. Uh, but from an accounting perspective, the numbers have to make sense. You know, and I think to answer your question, Brad, when you were asking like, you know, what do you do if you're, if you're negative cash flow, I'll touch on that because you answered it, but from a different perspective. They said they've never had a negative instance, but that's because they built in the cost of doing business. They actually understand that there may be a carrying cost of one month to get in the right tenant versus calling the partner with a different mindset of saying, oh my gosh, we're hemorrhaging money. We don't have a tenant right now. We're going to sign Uncle Jimmy. Uncle Jimmy moves in, destroys the place, and you have another problem. Um, you did touch on the one property that you knew I'd probably bring up anyways because we've talked about it a whole bunch. Oh, that's funny. Um, oh, that one right up there. Yeah, so the Ridgeway, that property that you guys see, a lot of you in this room have probably heard this story from me before um, just because within the network or whatnot. Kim and John and I have been working for some time together and we're opportunity based, right? Like we look at the best possible opportunity irregardless of if it's been listed on the market for six months or eight months. Um, and because of what we do here at our business, we actually have taps into different markets. So we do residential commercial investing. We know about commercial development happening in the city, job placement, stuff like that. John called me on this property. Um, we had driven by it previously. It was listed at 499 for a length of time. You want to kind of break down how the Ridgeway kind of happened? Yeah, so it had it, been up it been up more than once. Um, we kept going by thinking, well, why is this property in the kind of distressed situation where Asad and nobody's touching it? 
Um, when you drive by, it, literally there's just a there's an attached garage with kind of double parking. It's like okay, well it's four units. That's not enough. We like to have parking for all the units. Um, I noticed there's a what looked to be a driveway down the side. So it's a shared drive. Sure enough, there's extra parking spots in the back. John, Plus there's a garage. Can you speak up? Yeah. Plus yeah. a uh, yeah. so there's potentially three extra spots in the back. Um, we only use two of them just because the garage is dilapidated, but that's another story. So we thought, okay, well this is a deal that we'd like to do um, if we can get to the price where we want it. It's right near the Children's Museum for anybody that's from London. The Ridgeway is basically that one street that is in the news because of that yeah. the neighboring yes, owner. Yes. We're on the good side of the corner, yeah. not the yeah. bad side. If you go down the Ridgeway, you'll see some <laughs> absolutely stunning properties on the right hand side. The old Navy base is there. There's a footbridge that actually goes right to King and Talbot right there. But it was kind of an overlooked area, yeah. right? Yeah, and it, it was an overlooked property. Yeah. Um, the big challenge was is it was an absentee landlord or somebody who was, he was, he was done. Care. He was done. Yeah. He just wasn't doing anything. Um, and when you walked in, it was it was a challenge. Like the, the basement unit had what we would want to call a filler tenant. So that tenant, we knew day one going in that that product tenant was going to be a challenge. Yeah. They never paid rent. They had never paid rent to the existing landlord. It wasn't disclosed yeah. uh, properly during, but we had already anticipated that. So we fully knew that that was going to be an eviction going in. Um, it had one unit vacant. Uh, we renovated that one. The attic unit um, had a tenant that was a mismatch for the building, just personality-wise. She was a little bit challenging. We had to do a lot of work with her. Um, eventually, uh, she moved on to another property just because, like I say, she was a mismatch for just the, the property and how it worked. Um, but when we walked in, like the ba the bathroom in the attic unit, every time they had a shower, was leaking into the dining room of the unit below. Um, there were staircases that were falling off. It, didn't look so great. The outside of the building. John's <laughs> not scared of heights. I'm terrified of heights. Yeah. He's like on the fire escape on the side of the Justin, building. Justin, like, you're going to die. I'm going to climb up there. No, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. it's, it's partially yeah. on. Yeah, it was <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, it was a challenging looking building. For sure. Um, but amazing, amazing potential. And because it was sitting for such a long time, we yeah. were able to go in and do some crazy negotiating on it. When, when John called me for the building, he's like, what do you think? Literally, that's what he said. You're like, what do you think of the Ridgeway? I'm like, I love it. And it had been listed for like six months, and everybody else on the market was like, that's a nightmare, just like the Stanley Street properties that were there forever, right? Like, we, I looked at it, and I'm like, we had just done the deal for Arcane around the corner. So we did the deal for the Arcane building right downtown with York, and I'm like, that's like 120 new high-paying jobs right downtown, five-minute walk from this building. I'm like, the area's going to appreciate just because of that, right? Um, and relationships mean a lot. John Wiseman was a listing agent on that property. I used to work with John at Royal Page. Really nice guy, I called him and I just had a conversation with him. I'm like, so it's not worth 500, was my like opening line. And he started laughing, he's like, I know, I know. And I'm like, what gets it done, right? Like, the, where's it? he's like, what do you think? And I think we ended up landing at 460 prior to inspection. And then we knew that there was gonna be issues with the inspection. So we went in, did the inspection, asked for 15K off, found some novel tube, a list of 22 repairs from a fire safety standpoint. We had 20 conditions when we went back after inspection that the offer like grew by like five pages. And it's like, and they're they're great clients to have, and they're very understanding in terms of like what is normally acceptable, what's not. But they accepted all of them. Like yep. they fixed every single fire thing that I asked them for, because it was again just going back to John and just being like, this is this is what gets it done, right? Um, now that's kind of. The work that you saw on the property was scared away a lot of people, but do you want to talk about the upside of the property? Yes. And so uh, we did this with a, a, a financial JV. This was not the type of property that they had asked for. <laughs> so kudos to them because they had were thinking more. And, and they weren't supposed to be coming through on the walkthrough. <laughs> and then I informed Kim that they were coming. I was terrified. <laughs> yeah, they were like, we want to come to the property inspection. I'm like, oh, geez. Like, cause, like as the water's pouring out of the ceiling. Um, but that being said, they they totally went along with this. They saw the potential too. Um, so uh, we uh, ended up turning over uh, and renovating three out of four units the first year. So that was not exactly a, to plan. Um, we did an eviction the first year, which was kind of anticipated. Basement, right? Yeah, basement. Um, so uh, three to four units were done, and we still have one existing long-term tenant in the property. Um, but because of that, we were able to go back and refi that property. Um, and did really, really well on it. Um, we actually didn't take the full refi because we wanted to keep a good amount of cash for the property, so that was a good conversation with our financial JVs to say, do we take the full refi amount, pull the full amount, but then it would cash flow. Um, you know, it was still cash flow, but maybe less than we wanted to have on a month-to-month -month basis, but actually we went back to the bank and said, strangely, we don't want it all, we'll leave a little bit in. Um, and it's a really, really 
It was well, it's still enough to double everyone's return. Yeah. Um, in, in the investment. Are you comfortable sharing a little bit of what that refi looked like? Yeah. Just so people can yeah. understand yeah. the numbers behind it? Because that's a number guy. Yeah, so we, we originally we got the price down to 440000 um, We ended up putting about 45000 between all the units. Um, it came back um, at six seventy five, dollars um, two and a half years later. Um, so we went to, I think we made 625. dollars So we were able to pull out just over $100,000 on the refi. So we'd actually put money into that deal. Um, we put, so put 30000 in the deal. Um, it was our first one. We thought, you know, it's pretty scary. Maybe we better put some more skin in the game. Um, so we got all that back. Um, we split the refinance in half. Um, so now we're we're another twenty thousand dollars out of the property, and we still have part. Uh, and your money is yeah, and the our, our financial money is zero. Yeah. So our, your yeah. return is actually yeah. infinite. And if the you're actually getting that out. Yeah. And yeah. Our, our JV now, you know, from what they originally put in, um, now that's less than half. So the return is more than doubled on the property. Um, the the other unit that's still unrenovated. It's currently a very large one bedroom that by just by switching some doors. Is she still there? Yeah. She's she still there. That's she's a tenant. I knew the tenant. Like I was in. walking through yeah. and I'm like, she used yeah. to come. I used to Wait. run Cools back in the day. Like I used to manage Joe Cools. Yeah. And I'm like, she's awesome. She's yeah. actually she's a wonderful a great tenant. tenant. Yeah, she, she's, really she's the greatest tenant because she's never there. Yeah. So yeah. As far as like, it, it's an all inclusive unit and she's yeah. never there. So, yeah, so. Uh, but it'll actually, once one day when she does yeah. uh, potentially move on, it, it'll actually turn to a two bedroom. I was going to say it's yeah. huge. It's a monstrous one bedroom. So that's. That was part of it, is seeing the future potential in some of those units to be able to reconfigure the layouts. And being able to look at it and say, once that's done, then we can refi again and still cash flow on, on the second refi, which is a big thing for us. You kept, I'm assuming you kept some of the refi money in the project just from a cash flow perspective, right? Like, because if you just refi and it's worth a million, you pull it all out, well, all of a sudden it's not going to cash flow anymore, right? It, it would have cash flow, but less than we wanted to. Yeah. And we're anticipating being able to do a second refi on this property. So we would rather wait a little bit, have higher cash flow now, and then pull it again on a second refi. We just basically bank that because we know we're going to do that renovation in the future. Um, so then no one has to really come out of their pocket with it if it's already already there. Yeah, and they're playing. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Do you refi with another JV or with a, a traditional bank? Uh, no, it's it was refinanced uh, with a. It was actually it went to a different bank at the time, but um, we refinanced. It's the same joint venture that's held it, so we've now held it with them for a number of years. And you've done a number of projects with them, like it yeah. developed a relationship with the yeah. partners, right? I think one thing you'll learn just doing these types of things is there's a lot of money out there too like to the point where you'll be turning money away to a certain degree and if you're the money side of things there's a lot of working partners out there left right and center you'll be partnering with the ones that you like want to spend time with yeah. we've, and done, we've done four joint ventures with, with that the same. couple they weren't able to come today but yeah we've done four we're like really good friends with them and like literally they'll be going to another meetup i think they're running one next week at yeah. this couple's event like yeah. It becomes a family type dynamic, right? Which is again what we kind of do here is a family type dynamic. Yeah, business comes from it, but you really focus on the relationship first. Make sure you're a good fit with the person that you're working with, whether you're on the working side or the money side, and then you kind of narrow that focus to what's the value proposition of the money side of the relationship, what's the value proposition of the working side of the relationship, but then what is your exit strategy, right? Like that from the outset when you're looking at properties and we're looking at different opportunities. I kind of have an idea of what your exit strategy is and when we go through properties, we're kind of looking at it through the same lens, right? So how did you come up with that focus on this is the type of property we want to buy, right? It's properties that we like to live in personally. Um, so we kind of just kind of dealt with that, but we, we know how to add value. I really like to run numbers and I like to multiply them in my bank account quite often, so it just fits that bill. <laughs> um, it allowed us to, to free up some time, so doing more of the things that we like to do. Um, but yeah, our property type, we, we kind of jokingly say that we're property snobs. Um, we won't invest in just any any old property, you know that. I, I, <laughs> There's I know some that. that. I don't like, we had the same conversation on the other side where they'll send me this, what do you think? I'm like, I, I don't like it. Yeah. I, you don't like it either. You're like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so we're, um, we're pretty particular about the type of property that we like, um, just because we want to be able to confidently say that this is what we're offering. Mm -hmm. um, and we just got really good with that. We got really good with saying that this is, you know, this is the, the ballpark we play in, and if people want to invest in something else, that's amazing. Go find another investor who's just rocking that. For sure. And do that. Um, and just be really comfortable in your space. And you know, the more comfortable you become, the more you can grow in that space um, because it's yours. You, you can own it and you're not feeling like you're hanging on the edge of a cliff all the time because you don't know what you're doing. You're falling forward, right? I think people, I do want to touch on that definitely. Um, 
people in this world get too excited with the hype piece that comes around with real estate investing, right? And I think in this climate now more than ever, like we double down on the cautiousness, right? Like one of the reasons we work with Scott and that group is they're constantly innovating and changing what they're doing on the back and adapting to the marketplace, not just sitting down thinking it's this exact same sales pitch every single time. They actually teach you how to operate from a down market as much as an up market, where a lot of stuff I'm seeing that scares the life out of me these days is, you know, this is this is how you're gonna cash flow and make all this money off an Airbnb. Well, London's now discussing changing the rules around Airbnb. So how are you gonna operate in worst case scenario now? Right? Like you need to look at it from the lens that it's not always gonna be great. So let's talk about a JV partnership that can go sideways. Like how can joint ventures not work out other than just maybe not being able to have coffee together? There's, there's a number of ways, uh, so um, not writing it up from the beginning. Um, so one of the things is you'll hear people call it a JV partner or whatever. Um, it's not a partnership. So in any of your legal terms and any of your documentation, go talk to your lawyer, they're gonna tell you really clearly, do not put the word partner anywhere. Because partnership is actually a different business structure and maybe you do need a partnership but just make sure that you're writing this up with a lawyer don't download your JV agreement off of Google from the states or whatever um, because you could acci accidentally be writing up an agreement for something completely different than what you actually intended to do and then CRA when you do taxes is gonna look at that slaughter you're gonna yeah. love you they're yeah. gonna love you help with a national yeah. debt yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh, things like that you, like you need to have a power team with JVs like you need to be talking to uh, a like a lawyer and an accountant who understand joint ventures because if you write it up wrong, yep. if you're doing things wrong, then from a taxation and like even an exit perspective, it can change really. Um, even like just things like, um, depending on how you write it up, if you put an end date on your JV, it can change how your JV is taxed at the end as opposed to a review date. So we won't get into that because I'm not an accountant or a lawyer, but talk we don't to those people. On TV, yeah. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't do that by yourself. This is not a DIY agreement. Yeah. Um, and also, if you're a working joint venture, one thing I would tell you uh, that we've learned because it's changed in the past year or so is depending on how you structure your JVs, you are not getting off scot-free as far as you know going to a bank and then being able to qualify for other properties. So JV investments, if you're a working JV, even though you don't hold title and you don't hold mortgage, if you structure them wrong, then they will count towards your debt service ratio. Even if you don't own the property. Even if you don't own the property. So, so, so we're partners, I own 10, maybe I own five with you guys. Bank looks at them and think they own 10. Yeah. Because yeah. they're tied to me. Yeah, so right? again, you need to talk to a really experienced mortgage broker and accountant, make sure you structure these properly because a lot of working JVs will think, hey, I'm doing this and then I'm gonna go buy six of my properties myself. If they did four JVs first and didn't do that right, the first time they go to qualify for their first property, the bank thinks they're qualifying for their fifth property. And it's just because of the changes and how things have happened, and a lot of people can get sideways on that. Um, if you're just going to only ever do JVs, do them however you want. But if you're looking to still build your portfolio on the side, that's things we've learned where that's just it from a working JV. That's where you can go sideways and kind of get yourself upside down to what you actually plan to grow. Um, it seems like a minor thing. Sorry, go ahead. So a working JV is not on title. In, no. in, in our realm. That in is your in how yeah. These are yeah, we don't we don't traditionally hold mortgage or title, so our financial JVs hold that, but we because of how you have a JV agreement, you actually have a beneficial interest in the property. Which needs to be disclosed because yeah. I've seen yeah. again talk yeah, horror stories. The one type of business we don't do is anything that is blurring the lines, right? We get pitched stuff all the time and I turn away a lot of business because I just don't want to play in that sandbox. But we'll get people that want to do JVs but not have any vested interest in the property on paper from a tax benefit perspective. You get one strike like that, you're blacklisted. You won't be able to get a mortgage yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Just to be, if you do JVs, either as a working or financial partner, your T1 general is, or whatever your accounting structure is, if you're a corporate or whatever, is just going to be like this. So yeah. um, just be aware of that. And you, yeah, you just got to get, it's the background stuff, it's the paperwork. That's where things can go sideways if you just are trying to do it on the fly and figure it out on yourself. On the, on the larger side, like commercial, if you are the financial partner and you didn't disclose to the lender, um, that you have someone else on beneficial interest on this side. Mm -hmm. um, normally, on some cases, on a yearly basis, they like to have an update on the property, and they want to see all your documents. And now it shows that there's someone in there. They can just they, they can call the loan in 30 days. They can call the mortgage. Yeah. So, so 
you need to disclose that, talk to your mortgage broker, make sure that they're dealing with people that, that know that up front. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily going to happen, but it can happen. And we have, we know people that has. Properties working grid, all the bills are being paid. Financial partner phones the working partner says, listen, I have to sell the property. Kyle Hansen, a phenomenal lawyer out of yeah. Guelph with Miller Thompson Partner. <laughs> He's, shout out to Kyle, for three yeah. years of burning on a Saturday morning, probably <laughs> with his kids. Um, he's very stalwart with this. He's, I call him randomly for stuff all the time just to kind of get his thoughts on it because he operates in that world. And we were having a discussion in a private group this morning around somebody that went and had gotten some money from a partner, like a second lender, did a deal with them and just got raped over the coals because like some of the people that play in that world because it's frothy will take advantage of people that are just coming in looking for money. And they'll sign agreements not really understanding what they're signing and there's just fees on top of fees on top of fees and they end up paying 20% a year to borrow a little bit of money, right? So you gotta be very cautious of that. Why would you not put your, your name on title as a working partner? Um, the quick answer is because I don't need to. <laughs> um, Makes my life easier, yeah. less initials. So yeah, like. yeah. Um, they, we don't need to, in our case, the financial JVs are fully untitled, They're, they own the property. We're still um, attached to the property through the joint venture agreement, so we're still secure on it. Um, but uh, it allows, they're growing their portfolio, it's just the best structure you could. So in a JV, you could totally attach yourself as title. We just traditionally don't, and uh, we hold properties personally um, in our own portfolio, and uh, on so that's how we on the, on the flip side is, is say the working partner, um, they've already got a couple properties, they're kind of tapped out. Um, it doesn't make any sense for me to add my downfall, so to speak, to that that, that gen joint venture, mm -hmm. um, because now they're qualifying us as well if our names are going on. Well, they look at us and say, well, well, they don't, they don't have, they've got a lot of liabilities and not really much to put into the game to get from. Right. Um, so it's actually gonna hinder the deal. Um, so that's, that's another reason. The more complicated you make a bank qualifying, like the more people that are in, the more paperwork and the longer. They're in risk management, they're pulling every name, they're looking for a reason not to lend you money, like they're in the business of risk management, right? Essentially, like from a legal perspective, full disclosure on all sides with all parties, um, George Dubé, they run BDO, phenomenal accountants as well. Like we lean on them for a lot of advice from that perspective, right? Is, you know, because accountants and lawyers all go, go back and forth on structure, corporation names and putting it in the company, not in the company. You can let those guys sort that out. Um, we are not lawyers or accountants, yeah. we don't play one on TV, yeah. but I can tell you just from the other side of the transaction, like the more you complicate a deal with appraisers and lenders and everything else, it can change things. And the highest level people we know that own like millions if not billions of dollars worth of real estate, a lot of times have one name or one company that own it and there's like 35 partners behind the scenes. Yeah. But then we've seen the other side of that where we have people that there's one group that keeps buying farmland and around this area, there's 29 people that want to sign every document. So it took a little, <laughs> a little while for us to explain to them that they didn't have to do that. It took us a good lawyer and a good accountant to get there. So, you know, I, I really think this provides a lot of value from the standpoint of understanding the dynamics of a joint ventureship, uh, joint venture partnership. Because I think a lot of people have misconceptions. So, like, let's break some myths around joint ventures, right? Because I think, yeah, it's it's kind of the funnest part about this conversation is like people will come in skeptical from the get-go and just say, well, you're just you know tying yourself to somebody that has money and just benefiting from 50% of the interest, right? So I'm sure for some working partners that may be true, what are some of the biggest myths in joint venture partnerships that are out there? Um, probably one would be that you're giving up half your property. If you're the financial JV, then you're like, why would I give up half my property? Would you have bought that property by yourself? Because there's a good chance if you're doing it with a JV, that you are getting into a property that you personally would not have been comfortable doing. You didn't have the time for it, it was too big of a project for you, it was a rehab and you don't know how to hold a hammer, whatever that was, you wouldn't have done it anyways. So, <laughs> so because of that, um, you know, you're not, don't think of it as giving up something. You're actually, we always say JV is a way to combine and conquer. You're, you're building your portfolio or your investment journey by combining with the very best people who have the skills that make up for what you don't have. Yeah. In, in the case of a financial JV, you have maybe the money, you have the qualifying power, but you are maybe feeling lacking in another area. And so don't think of it, you know, go to that abundance mentality. I would not have been able to grow at this, we would not have been able to grow, but also there's a good chance you might not be able to grow at that scale if you hadn't have partnered up. So yeah. that's, you're not giving up 50%. Did you financial JV funding the whole rental or did you use another financial JV for the rental side? Uh, 
So the question was, is, uh, are we funding our, the run out with the JV? So in our case, uh, most of the time, the financial JV is also funding the renovation if we're renewing. Um, but that's a that's an open conversation depending on the JV investor. Um, we might also borrow it on a like a private lend or you know purchase plus improvements mortgage or whatever that is. It's a case by case basis. But traditionally, uh, the financial JV, they're a lot of times they're coming to us because we do we have an underperforming properties and so they're okay. They're already in the mindset that I'm willing to spend the money. They see the value add on the flip side, so they're fine to put it in. And I think it's getting comfortable. I'll let, just give me one second. I just want to touch on this point is from the entering the relationship, there's an understanding that there's two sides to the transaction, right? And just by human nature, people tend to look out for their own interest. When you're developing a partnership, you need to really look at how you're going to serve the other person. If you could put that person in the forefront of your mind and you try to outserve each other, you kind of grow together. If you look at say a $40,000 capital injection into a property where you're going to have a $200,000 upside, essentially, you know, when I'm giving you 40 grand and then you're going in there on a Saturday night climbing a scaffold to paint the unit or spending time with tenants or, or going through like it could go wrong on both sides where you know the working partner's like why am I doing this like why am I spending you know a hundred hours of my year going in and you know blood sweat and tears to make these people money or the money partner could say the same thing and say I'm just giving them all the cash to do it and they're just benefiting from half that's the, the natural inclination that you get in joint venture partnerships that don't really make a lot of sense but if you can understand the value or you know, care about the other person on the other side of the transaction, then it's a mutual beneficiary interest where you know, they take a property like this and they repainted that whole kind of top area, which they didn't necessarily have to do. Like they love heritage looking properties and they love century homes. So this is kind of a good fit for them. So as a money partner, you're actually getting the benefit of having somebody who actually loves doing that. And, uh, and they definitely don't like doing this type of stuff, right? So like, that's, I think, where the benefit's gonna be from a JV perspective of somebody that'll gladly write a check versus spending 100 hours of their year profiling tenants doing work and stuff like that. You had a question? Yeah, so when you're, in the example you're talking about, your joint venture partner gave the money for the reno, you go do the reno, do you also get paid a fee, like a little salary or anything, or are you, quote, doing it for free on a day-to-day -day basis because you are have half the property? In, Salary is... In, in this instance, we, we already banked our, our payment win because we were going to get half of the refinance. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't, I was working for free at the time. I wasn't going to paycheck, but I knew the paycheck was coming at the end. Yeah, okay. um, the reason why we like that is because that's a tax-free paycheck as well mm -hmm. when, we, when we get the refund. And we're also getting, yeah, we're also getting the cash flow distribution. So we're getting a portion of the cash flow every, every month, which is our payment. That being said, it depends on the property and it depends on your JV. Um, and you would structure it accordingly. So if you're going to pay somebody their property management fee or their contractor fee or whatever that is, then you would adjust the agreement to still make it a win-win where everybody's still happy with the the allocations and the money that you that you're agreeing on. It's the, the cool thing about JVs is they're entirely customized. And I think that that's one of the biggest takeaways from today is like you have to really put a lot of work into the structure of the JV rather than just getting excited that you met somebody with money or you met somebody with a good working skill set that you just want to jump in headlong because that's where people run into problems, right? Have an exit strategy and then reverse engineer it from there. Once you have the exit strategy and the property types you're going to be going after you really look at the partnership agreement from a legal and accounting perspective, and you have everything documented and written down, the last thing I'd like to suggest is go through the worst case scenarios, right? And you already touched on that at the very beginning of, you know, if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, how, how do we deal with this situation, right? Yeah, and everybody was, was very clear, like, we had a vacant unit from the get-go. Um, from the first day we took, took possession, there was bath people come in and they were ripping out a shower and putting a new one in. Um, and that scheduling that with the tenants and making sure everyone's on board. Um, where's all the material coming from? How much is that going to cost? How long is that going to take? Worst case scenario, probably four months. We got it done in three. Um, getting the tenant in and then moving on to the next unit um, or simultaneously getting that done. Um, and knowing that everyone can see it from the get go and we, the tenant that didn't pay from day one, so just the way we took possession, it was three days later, hey, your rent is due. I'm sorry we don't have it. Here's the proper paperwork. Mm -hmm. This is how we do it because the more you delay, the longer they can stay in, the, the more negative cash flow you're potentially in for. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
Best case scenario, it, it went really good for us because at the end of the day, that we did all the paperwork when it should have been done, and the tenants didn't actually show up to tribunal because they got the time wrong. So it was just in our favor. It was just this is what they did. Okay, they're out. Here's your here's your call. Okay. So. Worst case scenario, always plan for it. But also with the JV, because you're working with somebody else or maybe multiple people, communication is key. The minute something's gonna start going wrong, okay. instead of telling them when it went wrong or you know three days later, five days later, shoot an email, okay. make a phone call and say like, you know, this is happening right now. Just an FYI, I don't need you to do anything yet. I don't even need a response. Yeah, I'm just letting right? you know but, that FYI, this is going on. We got it. This is what we're doing to remedy the situation. This is the steps that we're taking. Um, if you have any questions about it, let us know, but we're just letting you know. It's communication is so important to let them know that this is what's going on, good or bad. Biggest, biggest mistake people make in business in general is not doing the worst things first thing in the morning, right? If you have to send an email, you got to update somebody on things that aren't going great, you just eat that frog, deal with it and actually get a lot more respect from people. I think trust gets lost in joint ventures or partnerships when something happens and you didn't communicate with that person something that they should have known earlier and then they just wonder why you didn't just reach out, right? When you kind of had that agreement to begin with. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just... Um, curious, did you do a lot of sweat equity yourself in doing all the, like, or did you orchestrate all your trades for when you did the work? In, in the in get-go, it, there was a lot of sweat equity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a lot. Um, when we started, we used to do a lot of it. Now, um, it's not a good use of our time. Our time now is better spent organizing the trades and the people that are coming in to do it. Um, if it still financially makes better sense for us to do it, because the trade that we really want is, you know, tied, up, tied up for the next six weeks, and we know we can do it in the next two days. Or we have three renovations going on at the same time. I can only be in one spot at one time. Mm -hmm. So um, what's the best use? Maybe it's that job that's going to save me $1,000 that day. I'll probably go and do that versus the $400 job over there. So that's kind of how we like that. Knowing how to make a sauce is always a good thing, too. Like being able to actually know what to expect from the trades, because that's the biggest challenge that anybody here that works <coughs> the trades is, is their pricing and actually executing the work once you agree to do something, right? Keeping on them and making sure that your timelines are on point is everything in this business, right? Doing it hands on first was super helpful now, because now if, if you're not that type of person, being hands on first off is then you know what it should be done or you know how you want it to be done. Um, and then you have an informed position on when you're talking to trades and you're talking through things with them. If you don't know what's going on, um, you're kind of just at their mercy and they might take advantage of that because they can see that. So. Probably not a good position to be in. Just like not dealing with the problem, putting your head in the sand like an ostrich, is kind of the same thing. It'll just work itself out. It probably won't. You got to take charge. It is your business, right? So at the end of the day, you got to take responsibility. Did you guys structure your JVs differently when you were putting in more sweat equity versus when you're just managing more of the trades and that sort of thing? Like if you're spending, you know, full 40 hours a week on a job, did you structure your deal differently based on that versus when you're only managing for 10 or was it worthwhile to you still? For, for the first one, we, when we knew we were putting a lot of sweat equity in um, and we actually had some money in the game, we were adamant that, you know, we, we'll be a part of the refinance. Going forward, if we're not really putting a whole lot of money in, just maybe the startup account and the, the JV agreement itself. Um, yeah, we don't really need that. We're, we're gonna we'll just oversee the trades, so I'm not really doing that much work. Um, so we'll just we'll just downgrade it from there, so that it makes sense for everyone. Yeah. Our JVs are generally all slightly different because um, it depends on what the other investor needs as a deal to make it work and what we need. So um, you can be a straight 50-50 down the middle, but we have some that um, you know we don't get as much cash flow, um, and we're okay with that because. Uh, you know, like Princess, we don't yeah. get as much cash flow on that, but that's because the JV that we did that property with, they borrowed for the down payment. So they're covering the cost that they're borrowing, um, but the property's But the asset's well. incredible, right? Yeah. Like that location. So, and so it's, it's the, that's something to ask when, the win -win. when someone's bringing money, where does that come from? Is it cash or is it, mm -hmm. is it borrowed money? What do you need? And what do you, yeah. what do you need to cover that? So they say, well, we need X amount to cover that. Is, is there room in the building to do that? Absolutely. What would the structure look like after? Because they get the first chunk of cash flow, and then above that, then we split this way. Yeah. And then, the, then so, it continues. Yeah, on. you just customize it. Awesome. Yeah. Do you want to do a whole question and answer yeah. question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, we can. We've got like half an hour to 
Yeah, I was, I was going to say, we went way over time in terms of the actual interview, and we way outsold this event, so. <laughs> we'll stop talking. We could talk um, all day. You want to do that right now? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so. So it seems like there's a lot of questions from the audience. So yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think organically it's kind of just happened, right? Yeah. So Kim will know all the answers, so. No. <laughs> we can yeah, talk so all day. It's dangerous. Do you have another question? Uh, yeah, when you purchase property to do a deal, <clears throat> do you do a private? Or do you do it through the traditional realtor and all that sort of thing? <laughs> all the I'm things. not here. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's different forms. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a thousand different forms right now. We yeah, touched on that. There's a lot of different things that are involved, so uh, including finance and print yeah. back, all these different things. <laughs> Uh, you, you still have to, from a legal perspective, like, I'll clarify this just from a legal perspective, from a, a real estate agent, REBA is the business act that protects consumers in real estate transactions. REBA 2002 actually applies to everybody. There's nobody that can't have that applied to them. It's actually illegal to trade in real estate if you're not licensed to trade in real estate. You can do private sales, private buyers, private sellers, but there can't be a middleman aside from a licensed real estate agent, right? But real estate transactions happen privately all the time, and I actually encourage people to do them. I'd love to hear your perspective on that, like finding deals and whatnot. But. Um, well, personally, we've, we've never actually done an investment property where we bought privately. We, we've personally bought our, one of our principal residents privately, but we also brought a real estate agent in on um, for the insurance side of the transaction, just so that we knew that it was getting done and they, we paid him just a set fee for that. Um, but from an investment point, mm -hmm. currently we, we are, have used the big lenders, we've used um, B lenders as well to get to get funding. Um, we've also borrowed private money to, to structure some of the deals, but we didn't use that to solely purchase the property. But from a, from a finding property perspective, like obviously we're, we're looking ourselves and you know, if we find something, but um, you know, leverage your experts. So it's, you know, we, we use Justin's team because, you know, they, they've they been through the property. There's a good chance they've been through the property or they go through the property and they're like, no. hey, we they just went through me. one. What do you think of it? No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, or yeah. they'll walk through one and we get a text and we, I just went through a property and it's totally your kind of property. So that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that being said, we're still, you know, bang, you know, banging on doors or looking up listings and stuff like that. But generally speaking, it's, it's a better use of our time to leverage the team that we have to be able to get them to negotiate through it. Um, you know, we might have some advice on how we want to read clauses or whatever, or what we want to make sure we include. But uh, we're, our time is better spent leveraging the people who are trained to do that. Um, and so that's. And I'll do the opposite of what you think I'm going to do, and I'll play devil's advocate on why you wouldn't necessarily use me, right? And I tell people this all the time: if it's in their interest, if we found a deal where I complicated the deal, I would back out of the transaction and I would let it happen. And I've done it before and I'll do it again, right? Because our relationship goes beyond a transaction. I don't need them to close on a fourplex to be okay. Like Prime is gonna be just fine, right? But in that good faith building over the years, it's a very trusting relationship that I know they're not gonna put me in jeopardy with the types of business that they're doing. And I'm tying myself to somebody who I'm happy to have a relationship with because of their ethics and how they hold themselves and conduct business. I also walk away from business that, again, could be a quick and easy paycheck with people I don't want to deal with because yeah. it's not worth the headache. So there's two sides to that and you kind of want to partner with somebody that's okay with you finding a unicorn deal and then not getting paid $50,000 on a deal. I, I walked away from one that was a paycheck of about that size and I'm happy for my client because they're making money and it's going to be a good thing for everybody in the future. right? I think that kind of answers it, right? But you'll find deals too, like just by relationships, right? By going for lunch with a guy that owns a business that happens to know somebody who's selling, right? And there's a lot of different ways that you can actually find opportunities, right? On the uh, property that you hold in your own portfolio, do you buy that through a corp or do you buy that in your own name personally? Um, so to this point, we've bought everything personally. We're now to the size where that's probably going to change. Um, but we talked to our accountant and at the beginning and said what makes best sense for us. Um, we don't hold a lot personally. Um, so in our case, it makes sense going forward if we start holding more, then we'll probably still keep those couple um, personally, but then we'll move to whatever structure 
it might be a preparation. I don't even know what it'll be. That's what somebody will tell me what makes sense and will weigh the pros and cons of it at that time. Depends on what you're buying from a real estate side too, just to help. If you're buying single family under four units, like you put in a court name, they're just not going to lend on that. Because they want to lend on you from the financing. Yeah, you have to, you will have to go back and do an amendment and put your name on it and then put it back in the corporation. You're much better off to have an assignment clause in your personal name and then put it into a corporation after. But that's just from a real estate transactional perspective. George may tell you something <coughs> different from accounting. Kyle may say something different from legal. So, and then Lindsay, you had a question. Yeah, do you do like a set time of like how long you're gonna hold the property? Um, like when you discuss like a certain year that you'll reassess, maybe you'll refinance, maybe you'll, someone will buy the other side out, kind of thing. Um, traditionally, we're looking at buy and hold properties, so we're looking for a long term. We don't have a set end date. What we do is we build in a review period in our JVs. So our, all of our JV agreements say um, the JV agreement will be reviewed on year three or year five, um, and then at that time, you know, decide whether you're just going to keep keep rolling and just keep going, um, or if at that time, you know, it's going to be an exit. Um, and our JV agreements have multiple exit strategies. So we have straight sale, we have, you can buy them out, you can have right of first yeah. refusal, shotguns, everything and anything um, in it. And uh, so at this point in time, all of ours are buying hold and they're just rolling. So there's no goal at any point in time to sell them until it makes sense. Like if you get to a point where you go to refinance it and you realize that it actually makes much more sense to sell it at that point in time, just because then maybe you can sell it and take the money out and buy two more or something. If that was the case, then at that point, you get a lot of network to network stuff. So like I get random texts from people all the time. Hey, what's it worth now? Or like, that's what we do, right? So a lot of times when they call me on the Rageway, I say conservatively 600, they end up being 675. So under promise, over deliver, right? That's the plan. Um, the, I may have a partner call me, the one on Way Bell that we were talking about. That was a, a member within our network and it just wasn't the right asset for that owner. There was another person in the network that we had listed it off market that it's actually the perfect property for them. They're much more detail orientated and it took about 60 days to get that deal done. But it's an asset that ended up going to somebody who knows the other person who's involved in the transaction, right? So again, finding deals, a lot of it could be within networks of investors and people that you know are just changing where the property types are at. Because the biggest question we get asked is, why are they selling? You know, Everybody thinks every seller is distressed. I'm like, they made a lot of money. Grandpa Jimmy bought it for 140,000. It's now worth 750. Like, he never raised the rents, which is a huge opportunity for you guys, but he doesn't want to go through the process of dealing with all the tenants and renovations and everything else, so the upside's there for you, right? So, does anybody else have any questions? Oh, got another one, okay. I want to know a little more about the Waybell property as an example. Sure. Using it as Great an example. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so it was a off-market fourplex that we sent out to the membership. It was actually purchased by a investor before he met us. So he overpaid actually from day one. So he literally booked a tour with us, came to our, I think the week before he called me, had written a contract with a listing agent because he thought I'd get a better deal just going direct to the listing agent. Unbeknownst to him, listing agent's legal mandate is to get the best price for the seller. A lot of people will just say, oh, but he's gonna make double the commission. Yeah, he is, he doesn't really care. But at the end of the day, his mandate is to make as much money for the seller as he could. So we overpaid from day one. I consulted on that on year two after we met. Started going through the process with the system, started working to get the rents up. I helped him, even though I had no vested interest in the transaction to begin with, because that's just my mandate, right? He wants to list it. I tell him not to. He's like, I want to sell it. I'm like, no. I'm like, you haven't made enough money to cover the fees and the exit. I'm like, the market's great. Just hang on to it. Keep working on it. A year later, he's like, okay, I want to sell it. I'm like, okay, market's actually gone up to a point where it makes sense. Property wasn't in an ideal situation. The guy in the back unit you know, was like running a scrapyard in the backyard, massive dogs, it's wet, it's winter, it's dark, you go see the property, it sounds like Kudrow's behind the doors. <laughs> it's a lab, he was totally fine. My home inspector was terrified, but. So we were gonna put it on the market in December, I think, that was the plan. He's like adamant, he's like, oh, gotta get it up, we gotta get it up, and I'm like, we do, but we gotta do this the right way. Because I said, you could end up with 500 or 525, you can end up with 575, 600, right? So we started going through and I realized it's gonna be more work than I thought it was. Right around Christmas, we keep forging through and the plan was February, we were gonna list it, we're cleaning it up and everything else. Um, an investor within our network saw the coming soon sign, saw the newsletter I put out, called me and I'm very honest. Everything I just said to you, I told him. I'm like, kind of rough shape, we're cleaning up the scrapyard, we're dealing with the units and everything else. Terrifying dogs, but it's actually, they're really nice. Um, are, are you good with that? He's like, yeah. He's like, I'll put an offer on it, you know, basically at what they want for it. 
knowing that I've got my built-in upside because I'm going to clean them up and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. We went through the inspection. We had actually got it pre-inspected. He brought another inspector in. We, did, we were fixing some things that came up in our inspection report anyways, but we got an extension, ended up doing the deal, but it took a lot of work to get it to the point where the investor that was purchasing it was happy with the price that he got it at, the condition it was in when he was closing, understanding what he's going to deal with with the tenants versus just trying to get the very best deal on the property with the seller that probably would have just waited. And maybe like on the other side, the seller, had we cleaned it up and gone to market in February and March, we maybe would have got more, but nobody can dictate the future, right? And at that point, 550,000, which for that area is phenomenal. Like, so, so then, because I would love that building. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, by us, or, well, I'm assuming all of us, but I am on your yeah. email distribution list for sure. now. Yes. <laughs> would I have known about yeah. that then? It went out to the membership okay. first. Okay. And people that just ran hard numbers on it ran. 525 is what basically probably the market would have said. Um, if I actually put it on MLS, 550 to 575 would have been very fair to expect. So the buyer that bought it probably has a $25,000 built-in upside. The seller that sold it doesn't really care because he made enough money on it. I got him out of a bad situation. Plus, it wasn't the right property type for Leo, the guy that sold it. It's definitely the right property type for the guy that owns it now because he's very hands-on. So the property manager won't be able to sneeze without seeing what's happening with the property, right? But that's great, that's what I want. We've done multiple deals with the guys that bought it. They bought two fourplexes in Woodstock, I think, or two side-by-side -side anyways. And they're very hands-on. They took two dilapidated assets, did really well with them. Um, so now we're taking Leo and we're putting him into an asset that he can manage from the distance that he's at. That suits him as an investor more than what he actually thought he wanted, right? When you wrote up the deal on that, did you ask for vacant tent vacant tenancy or you're gonna No, we had one tenant that was leaving anyways, we knew that. So that was kind of written in with the property manager, but we didn't there was no vacant tenancy agreement. It's it's really difficult to provide that anyways. Like you can do cash for keys and you can provide N elevens and you can do everything left, right, and center, but until the tenant's actually gone, assume that the tenant's still gonna be there. Or just don't close. You have to be okay to walk away. Like we did one on Prince 843 Princess. Brian killed that deal. Um, and we did negotiate vacant possession of the two units. I went back four times myself personally to make sure they were gone or I would not have told them to close because the hoarder in the basement would have been like, he was the cleanest hoarder I've ever met. He, <laughs> if you're missing any electronics, they were in his basement. <laughs> <laughs> Very organized. Um, but again, right, like that could have been a big issue. So I'd say like, using your final walkthroughs and, and making sure that you're not just assuming things are going to be okay, always assume the worst, is how to end up in the best situation, right? So we have a question from Facebook Live. Facebook Live, okay. Uh, can Kim and John touch a bit more on having separate bank accounts for each property? Do they find this more efficient than separate receipts for each property? Kudos to you for watching that much of the video. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so thanks. Uh, we do separate bank accounts for each property. Um, you don't, I'm going to say talk to your accountant, but you don't have to if you if you have multiple properties with the same investor. But as far as financial JVs, anything we've ever heard, and just for a sanity perspective, is make sure that you have a separate bank account per financial JV so you're not mixing money. Don't mix other people's money. Don't mix your own money. Keep it all separate. Um, but from a booking bookkeeping perspective, so much easier. It's John. Cheaper, um I mean, some of the, the, especially for us, when we do a renovation or something, I mean, I've got receipts coming out the wazoo. So when you're trying to track something, make it as easy as possible. So put it in one, put the other one into the other one. Um, it just makes life a lot easier, especially when something's gonna be lost or missed. Yeah. And then like, well, which property did that go for? At least you know where, where to be looking instead of looking all, all through one, you, you dumb it down a little bit. And so that just means you're just gonna have the most large collection of debit cards you've ever had in your life. Like seriously, you're like you get like a stack. Um, and but you can do checkings and savings and yeah. others, so you can you can yeah. stare, narrow it down. Yeah, like a trench coat in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so get familiar with that. But yeah. Yeah, I'm curious. A question that popped in my mind while you were saying that was, I mean, something that does happen. I'm sure in some partnerships where things aren't clear from the beginning is get a random phone call on a Saturday night. Why'd you buy a seventy-five dollar toilet? Like. I think that's one another reason to have the bank account so they can go in and see, oh, okay, those repairs yeah. are being done. Yeah, and that's what that was. Our financial JVs, it's, it's actually generally set up as part of the mortgage, so it's actually their bank account. 
in we're almost in all instances. And we're just, we have full, like we have a full access card for it. So it's actually, it's a lot of times the bank will want you to set up an account to pay your mortgage. You don't have to, but they'll just give you one anyway. So take it, because then it's for your property. You're good to go. Um, so we have full access cards, but they can then see um, the, they are, they're in there if they want to. And yeah. they watch. Um, all of our JVs, we have it set up so that there's an agreed upon amount that any expense Low, that, yeah. we don't have to ask any permission, we don't have to tell anything, it depends on the size of the property and what we're doing, yeah. um, but it would be like any expense under $250, we don't have to say anything about it, if it's over 250 or whatever the number is, pick your number, um, then we generally shoot an email and say, FYI, we're buying this, got a problem with that, let us know, and they're like, no, good, sounds good, and we'll, you know, say where we're getting it from or whatever, but... The reserve yeah. fund? Yeah. It's coming out of the reserve, and we actually don't do cash distributions monthly. Um, a, it's not normally required, and B, it's super a lot of bookkeeping. So if you don't need it, um, we generally do cash distributions. We have a lot that just do annually, so we actually just pay out cash flow once a year. Okay. Um, or we'll pay out uh, biannually two, two times a year, and everybody has the right to request a cash flow um, distribution at any time with like seven or 14 business days, just because if a big mortgage payment or something's coming out, we might want to have to be reasonable, right? Right. Um, so you can request it on other amount, but most of our financial JVs, they're not they're not necessarily looking for the monthly. Yeah. If they were, we would talk about it and we could do it, but um, they're good with just getting that that payout. A, a reason to keep it in as well and have a reserve is when you're going to finance the next property, the banks are going to say, well, financial statements, da da da. When they can see multiple properties with multiple large sums of money in the deposits, they're more than happy to lend. But if nothing is in the bank accounts and you have multiple, you got liquid cash. Um, mm -hmm. it doesn't look so good. So, so it's, if, it's you're, if your financial JV is going to be buying a property, hang on to your cash flow distribution. For, don't for distribute that, it yeah. until they're done closing, because then they can show that they have cash reserves. When I when I recommend yeah. JV partners, <clears throat> like somebody that understands the numbers is number one. I've offered John a job like. <laughs> Ten times at least. He's all, he's the numbers guy. Because he's super conservative, but our lenders actually love it because they just okay they understand that you know from a risk aversion perspective you're actually looking at it with the same lens that the bank is, versus you know we'll just buy this pro you know shoot first and we'll figure it out after like that scares banks and lenders because they they've seen 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of ups and downs, and if you're just you know buying properties and figuring it out later, you're going to get caught eventually, and if you're doing it with other people's money. You're putting them in a very uncomfortable position, right? So I think from the outset, understanding why you're doing it, doing it for the right reasons, finding the right partners is kind of everything, right? But one more thing to add is if, if you know your partner and your JV as well, um, and you know there's going to be refinancing on another property that they don't even have with you, but they're, they're like, well, we'll do our cash flow and everything, take that out. I said, well, you might want to hold off on that until you finish that refinance over there with so-and-so yeah. because that might not actually work um, in the way the lending rules change. Yeah. Quite often. Don't go buy a boat before you're going to sign the mortgage. So yeah. that a lot. And I'm like, oh, I never thought about that. Thank you very much. I'm like, no problem. So, yeah. I think that speaks to the relationship as well, right? Because, I mean, people with a scarcity mindset, when a JV partner goes and buys a deal with somebody else or somebody buys a deal with another real estate agent, you think, like, yeah, I get hurt. I could care less because of our relationships, right? But it probably happens in yeah. other relationships where people hide things from each other and then that becomes an issue, right? Our, our rule is, uh, even if we have somebody who says, like we're ready we want to buy a property but then three weeks later they message us and say hey you know we were talking to so and so and they have a great deal and they feel so bad because we told me we buy with you go for it go, go for it yeah. like go if it's an amazing deal yeah. and i can bring it to you go buy it with somebody else still be like, friends it's still a great deal and hopefully maybe later you'll come back and do one with me later or you'll send somebody else our way but if i can't get something to line up and somebody else has something awesome why am I standing in your way? Go, go. Well, the Ridgeway is on the Ridgeway, obviously, 18. It's right on the corner. But if you actually go on Stanley Street, which is two streets over, there was 44 and 46 Stanley, side by side, fourplex and fiveplex, and nobody in London wanted to touch. They didn't want them. We sold them to another investor that's in our network. They did really well with them, yeah. right? And But from a community perspective, they raised the values of the entire neighborhood. And then, so the more deals everybody does, the more everybody's making more money. Yeah, it's going to be a catch-up game in terms of like where the price points are at and actually getting into the market and finding opportunities, which that's part of it. But that's the game that a lot of the people that I'm looking around the room here actually enjoy is the hunt <clears throat> and the work and the paychecks and everything else are why you're doing it obviously to, to build, but it's 
actually the work and the sweat equity and everything else that you look back on it with the fondest memories of like when you climb the scaffolding to paint that and everything else, the money becomes just part of it, right? I even got her up three and a half stories. She's terribly scared of heights. So we, we, like, we have followers on stuff like that, but we did the whole scaffolding, follow us, everything, and I'm not a heights person, but we did. The last little bit awesome. was me standing on the edge with a paintbrush yeah, on a, on a so about a six foot stick. <laughs> <laughs> and she stood back, I'm like, am I getting it? Am I getting it? Yeah. There's that like one spot where uh, there's a, there's a, the hydro line comes in, and you, so you couldn't get the scaffold oh, high okay. enough, right? So, enough. so she was like, okay, yeah. But there's a good life like lighting trick when they do like the before and after. See that? Oh, oh the yes. lighting's perfect on the left and right, but on the left hand side, and they're like smiling in one photo, not smiling in the other. Um, any other questions? Any of you guys have? Awesome. I think that kind of wraps things up in terms of JVs. We'll have the replay on the private group. If you're not on the private group, then just email me directly. I'll send you the link for that. But appreciate your time as always, and they'll be here for questions after. Yeah. Awesome.